Lord Jesus Christ, I'd like to welcome you to the online chapel of St. John's United Church in downtown Moncton, New Brunswick. The music you just heard was our organist, Mike Day, accompanied by Milton Ingalls. Mike was playing the grand piano and Milton was playing the pipe organ. And they played the song to Abraham and Sarah. And we'll be reading from Genesis today and the passage that that hymn is based on. What a gift to hear them play. At this time of year, we like to acknowledge the graduates in our congregation and those who have been noted for academic achievement. As always, we have a bright group of young people, and I'd like to spend a few moments celebrating them and their hard work. We've watched them grow from babies into little kids, to teenagers, and to the people who they have become today. And let me say this on behalf of St. John's, we are so proud of each of you. Let's begin. Sarah McRae started attending St. John's years ago with her parents and her brother Han. Sarah is a quiet person. However, I realize that she's always observing things and taking in what's being said around her. When Sarah took part in our vacation Bible school, there was always a little one holding her hand, and I will always appreciate Sarah for that. Aside from being very smart academically, Sarah is also a musician in Sistema, and she plays trombone for the New Brunswick Youth Orchestra. Sarah plans to attend Concordia University to study kinesiology. Her parents are very active members of St. John's, Graham and Cheryl McRae. Sarah, I'm so happy for you and proud of you, and I know good things await you in this world as you use your gifts and your knowledge to make it a better place. On behalf of your church, congratulations. Sarah is a recipient of a Henrietta Potter Scholarship from the trustees. My earliest memories of Everett Patterson or of him as a little boy who was always very active in the church. Everett has been a big part of the life of our congregation, whether taking part in worship to helping with the Vacation Bible School program where he became an essential part of our leadership team. I and everyone here at the church are so proud of you, Everett. I know that your parents, Nancy and John, and your siblings, William and Eleanor, celebrate your graduation from Mount Allison University. Everett graduated with his Bachelor of Science with first class honors with distinction and a double major in mathematics and physics. He plans on attending the University of Waterloo to study for his master's in science and physics and play some soccer and ultimate frisbee when he's not playing the trombone. William Patterson just finished high school where he was a volunteer in the Best Buddies program for children with special needs. He's been admitted to Queen's University, but he's looking at being an exchange student in Spain, where I highly suspect he'll be playing a lot of soccer. Everett is the kid who wore soccer shorts to church in the middle of winter. I used to think he was just hoping for summer, but I know now that he was just thinking about soccer most of the time. William became a big part of our Vacation Bible School over the last few years, and we watched him mature into a wonderful young man after his brother left. William stepped up into a leadership position where the kids absolutely loved him. One day we were taking the kids on a field trip, and we were all walking, and I looked ahead of me, and there were about six little boys, three on each side, all holding hands with William in the middle. Here's to you, William. You go with all of our respect and prayers. William is a recipient of a Henrietta Potter Scholarship from the trustees. Emily Steves recently graduated from Riverview High School, where she took part raising funds for charity. Emily is one of those quiet people who's always thinking and always smiling. She has this way about her that is kind and helpful, which is why everyone at the Parkland Estates love her so much. I think she inherited a lot of new grandparents over there because she's become a vital part of their family and community. Emily has been an important part of our Vacation Bible School over the years. The little kids treated her like a big sister and she was always there for whatever we needed. She was so dependable. Emily will be attending St. Effects University where she will be pursuing a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition. Her parents are Bruce and Catherine Steves, her sister is Laura, and her grandmother is Roberta, and Roberta is a member of our congregation. Emily, I am so proud of you and all that you have accomplished. I've enjoyed getting to know you over the years, 
and I look forward to where life takes you next. We've watched you become the person you are here at the church, and you will always be held in our prayers. Emily is a recipient of the Henrietta Potter Scholarship from the Church Trustees. Adam Stultz is the son of Terry and Allison, and he's a graduate of Bernice McNaughton High School. Adam is a really active guy, and sports are a big part of his life. He does cross country, volleyball, he's belonged to basketball varsity teams. He's one of these young people that I got to know at the church when he was little, and then now he's taller than I am. One of the things that I've always appreciated about him, because I know he was very busy with sports most weekends, is that when he could be in church, he was. When he was here, he was most often ushering with his parents at the door. When people would arrive, he would welcome them and hand out bulletins, which I think is one of the most important jobs around here, to see a smiling face from a young person. Adam is off to Dalhousie University, where he will study engineering, and I have no doubt he will be successful in whatever field he chooses. Remember how much your family and your church family love you, Adam. We are so proud. Best of luck, and our prayers go with you. Finally, I want to congratulate Alex Welch, who is a graduate of Riverview High School. Alex is an athlete who played hockey both at the high school level and provincially. He's another one of those quiet young people who were taught to respect the people around him. I've gotten to know him bit by bit through the years, and um, I know that his, uh, I've gotten to know him through his father's mother and his mother's father, so his grandparents on both sides, and his grandparents were so proud of him. Alex has been accepted into the New Brunswick Community College, where he will study business, and he's the son of Christine and Mike Welch, and his grandmother Lillian attends St. John's. Congratulations, Alex. I wish you all the best. Congratulations to all our graduates. Our pastoral care and membership committee will be delivering small tokens to you in the time to come. I'd also like to take this opportunity to congratulate a member of our church, Dr. Vicki Melly, who is a chemistry professor at Mount Allison University in Sackville. She is a recipient of the 2020 Paul Perret Excellence Awards for Teaching, Research, and Outreach. Congratulations from all of us, Vicki. Let us continue in our service. I'd like to share our opening prayers for today's service from the sanctuary of our church. It's a place where people have gathered for well over 100 years in prayer. And so our prayers are offered from this space today. Please join me in our call to worship. It's based on Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Bring your silence and your shouting as introverts and extroverts. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Bring your songs and your stories, your struggles and your sacrifices. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He designed and created us. He understands us and is intensely interested in us. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Bring your gifts and your personalities, your strengths and weaknesses. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. He is just and wise, honest and true caring and compassionate, eternal and holy. He is God. Now please join me in our opening prayer. Holy One, who we so often don't recognize, come into our midst and make your presence known. Renew our strength, refresh our imaginations, retool our weary efforts to carry your peace into the world. Amaze us with your power to make all things new and let us face your world with curiosity and hope. In the name of the one who leads us on the way, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And now I would invite you in our prayer of confession. Lord, 
Like Sarah and Abraham, we may be discouraged, tired of waiting for a future that seems impossible. Is anything too wonderful for God? O oh God, you call us to seek you in all times and places and work with courage to prepare the way for your kingdom. But our resolve too often fails and we give up too soon. Holy One, have mercy. O oh God, you call us to offer peace to friends and strangers, to prepare the way of your kingdom. But we fail to cultivate the spirit of peace in our own lives. Christ, have mercy. O oh God, you call us to be full of joyful confidence, to, pre to prepare the way of your kingdom. But anxious doubt often burdens us and blocks our witness to your good news. Holy One, have mercy. And our words of assurance. Sarah laughed at first, doubting God's promise. Sarah laughed at last, delighted at God's promise fulfilled. May we laugh in hope and delight in pondering how wonderful in Christ our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. We'll now have our readings from Scripture. A reading from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of the Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, Make ready three measures, quickly, of choice flour. Knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I have grown old, and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season, and Sarah will have a son. But Sarah denied, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. Our second reading will be shared by Becky Campbell. Hello. I thought I'd pop in and record this uh, quickly. Getting sweatier by the second out in the garden. And um, the children are about to find me. But before I did record this, I just want to say um, how much we all really miss you. All of you. And we can't wait to see you all soon. So, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. 
but God proves his love for us in that while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Becky. We miss you too. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, selected verses. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve sent out, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, you received without payment and give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics, or sandals, or a staff. For laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy, and stay there until you leave. And as you enter the house, greet it. May God's blessing be added to our understanding of these words. Let us pray. God of holiness, God who enters into the pain of this world, enter into our hearts and minds now as we reflect and consider how it is your spirit is at work in this world and in our lives and in the church. Amen. I was reading this week about the concept of mutual aid. It's this grassroots idea of doing things for each other to help each other and the ways we can, where we can. So it would be like buying groceries for your neighbor who can't get out. It's about meeting the needs of the people around us. There's a hope that after the coronavirus, the needs of our world will be still there and that we will expect more of one another as neighbors and as strangers. But it's this concept of mutual aid that I find fascinating because it ties so well with Matthew's gospel today. It's a time when we won't know the consequences of our actions until two weeks have gone by. Kierkegaard said that life can only be understood backward, but it has to be lived forward. As time goes by, three months feels like six months. We're realizing more and more that we're going to have to learn to live with this virus. Emphasis on live. We've had this willing paralysis where we've hunkered down. Those of us with compromised immune systems or who are vulnerable have to keep vigilant. And this is why mutual aid is something that's so important in how we will navigate this as a church community that seeks to not only care for one another, but to care for the world. Jesus didn't call us to, care, to take care simply of the church. He sends us out into the world, and Matthew's gospel today gives us a pretty clear idea of what he wants us to do. He wants us to cure the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, and to cast out demons, those four things. And when it comes to curing the sick, you don't need a master of divinity or to be a medical doctor or a nurse to do those things, to pray and to heal. What you do need is faith. In all of my prayers and visits to the hospital with sacraments, I've never once cured a disease. But Jesus is always focused on the moment while seeing the bigger picture. What if the disease affecting our society today isn't just COVID-19? 
What if there's another disease right now called racism? How do we as a church seek to cure that as followers of Jesus? We've now had two First Nations people in New Brunswick killed by police in the span of about a week. We have video images emerging of people being attacked by police who belong to different races. You know something that gave me hope? I was on the phone with Jack Christie. He was talking to me about how hard it's been since his beloved Jerry died. Jerry was this wonderful force of life. And he told me that, you know, you build a routine after 60 years and now that she's gone, he has to create a new one and that's hard. And you, know, you miss the little things like the, the cookies that she baked. I miss those too. Of his grief, he said that the only difference between a good day and a bad day is our outlook. And as soon as I hung up the phone with him, I could hear these little drums and whistles outside. And I went out to take a look and some children with their parents in the neighborhood were leading a Black Lives Parade down the sidewalk. Our neighborhood is becoming more and more diverse. And I hope that the hearts and eyes that needed to see that little parade saw it and found hope like I did. When it comes to raising the dead, my thoughts often go back to the prodigal son, whose father said when he came home, the son of mine was dead, and now he lives again. And it's this idea that being dead isn't simply a physical thing, it can be an emotional thing or a spiritual thing. What if raising the dead isn't about going to cemeteries, but going into people's hearts? What if reawakening people to life is what we're about when they've been dead to what it is? Is that what Jesus calls us to do? I've watched people who've been angry at God or the church or given up both and find their hearts strangely warmed and sitting in a pew for the first time in years. I remember one woman saying to me after she decided that her fight with fundamentalism was over and that she needed this new un understanding of church that she said, I didn't know what to wear to church. I haven't dated God in a long time. When it comes to cleansing lepers, in some of the encounters in the gospel with lepers, Jesus touches those who were perceived to be untouchable. The people who weren't allowed in the city center and had to exist in the fringes of society. Those who needed some compassion. We've been having some incidents lately at the Caring Kitchen over the past few weeks that ask us to think a little differently about how to solve a problem. To use compassion and not enforcement. I am a firm believer that because Jesus told us to feed his sheep, then we are to do just that. And Bruce and his staff and volunteers are so faithful to the task. I think when we deal with vulnerable members of our city, what we think of as common sense isn't really their priority in that moment when they're just extremely hungry, that they're not, they don't have sustainable housing, that there's a lot of mental health issues at play. And some things, some behaviors have become a priority and an issue as our neighbors have told us. I was really proud of our church council chair, Roland Gallant, when he said that police won't solve this problem, even though it was a matter of trespassing. So Bruce created more signage saying to, to love our neighbors and to respect them more. And he went over and spoke to the people who were causing the concerns. And the problem has been temporarily solved. And I'm sure it's gonna flare up again, but creating a relationship with people is what's important here. That's what Jesus did with the lepers. It was relational. And at some point, a no trespassing sign in a church stops working. And we have to ask ourselves, is that the kind of thing that we want to put on a church anyway? In fact, people rip the ones that we had on the church down anyway, so it's going to get expensive if we keep doing that. So we have to find a better way to let people be here and to let them move on all the way loving our neighbors. Not easy work, this gospel stuff. I was out filming, filming myself in front of the church a few weeks ago for a service when one of the clients yelled at me that I'd better not be taking his picture. And this Cape Retner welled up from within me and I shouted back, said, I'm not taking your picture. I'm taking mine in front of the church. And the woman beside him said, oh, do you want me to hold your phone? <laughs> I laughed. De-escalation. As for casting out demons, well, that's work that unfortunately seems to be in abundance these days. I think it's the hardest one. Just go into the comments section of any news article you read. It's like legion in there. Everyone erupting and angry. Remember that story in Mark's Gospel about the guy possessed by demons who lives naked in a graveyard? 
Well, that's what I'm seeing in the comments section because when Jesus asked him his name, he responded, Legion, which means many. We all have friends and relatives who think that the coronavirus is some kind of hoax involving Bill Gates and 5G cell phone towers or that it's nothing worse than the flu. White supremacists seem to think that they can hold parades and wave the Confederate flag. When I see the anger in people's words and on their faces, just watch the videos in the news. Does it not seem demonic to you that something has possessed them and that something is hatred and fear? Jesus tells us to cast that out. But how do we do that? Logic and facts and science don't seem to work with some people. Compassion doesn't seem to work with some people. A pastor down in the United States sued, I think, the state of California so that his church could open as an essential service. And when he did that, when he reopened his church, 17 people, including members of his family, were infected with COVID-19. I do think that people confuse their rights and freedoms with their religion, which is why we see so many flags prominently displayed in churches. It's hard to show mutual aid to one another when we can't find some kind of common ground. It's hard to be followers of Jesus when the world is so broken, as he tells us to shake the dust off our sandals when we aren't welcomed in a town and to keep walking. It's a protest against those who don't welcome the message of good news. Not the kind of news that says you are less than because the color of your skin. You are less than because of who you love. You're less than because you don't worship in the right way or believe the right things when it comes to God. But we are to bring actual good news to people. Not news that's going to cause more pain. A friend of mine is an author named Karen Walrond. And she shared this in... Um, shared this message and it, I think it really helps us in understanding our resistance to what is demonic in this world as we protest against it. Mutual aid thrives on sustained personal relationships even when those relationships now are sustained online during this pandemic. I think that's what's at the heart of Jesus' message for us in Matthew's gospel is this importance to be of service to somebody else the importance of being in service to the world. It's about working day to day to try and create the kind of world that we want to live in, the kind of world that Jesus calls the kingdom of heaven. And we have a lot of work to do as the church, me and you, the people serving meals at the basement door, those who are praying from their hospital rooms for their grandkids. I just did the funeral this week for Arlene Mundell at the funeral home and we had social distancing and um, you know only 50 people could come and as I looked down on the front row there were all of her grandkids and I just remember I said to them you know that a grandmother's prayers are powerful and they'll keep they'll keep being present in their lives for the rest of their lives that their that their grandmother had prayed for them there are those who are carrying signs along our streets and waterfronts saying that black lives matter there are those taking part in healing walks in response to the killings of First Nations people. We have work to do. And as Jesus said, as you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Except for some people, the good news isn't good at all. It's scary because it means a complete change in their worldview, a complete reordering of what they believe to be true and to be right, that they understand that no matter the color of someone's skin, they are loved by God and equal. For others, it will literally mean saving their lives to create a world that is welcoming, a world that is just. Anything is possible. As the angel says in the story from Genesis, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? All things are possible with God. I love that moment when Abraham says to Sarah, you know, you laughed when the angel said that you were going to have a baby. And Sarah says, I didn't laugh. And Abraham says, oh, yes, you did. And it's like this uh-oh moment that she had offended an angel. A few Christmases ago, I talked about the idea of this Moncton angel sitting on top of the Bell Alliant Tower. And she's encouraging us and appealing to our better angels. And 
I do believe that there are angels among us, like the angels that visited Abraham and Sarah that day. I do believe that there are people, that angels are among us in the way of people doing good works because I've met a few of them. And the message of the angel to Sarah was that she would embark on a new journey. And the message of that angel sitting on top of the Alliant Towers to us is still, worry pa. May God be with all of you. Amen. today's prayers, I wanted to focus on students at this time of year as they transition from one thing to the next. And so I invite you to pray with me for our young people. Let us pray. God of joy and hope, we thank you for this time of graduation in the lives of these young people from our church and in our city and across the world. They're graduating in a time of great turmoil for our world. Yet, they give us hope. Your spirit of wisdom has empowered their hard work and discipline in such a way that their hunger for learning has been nourished with knowledge, discovery, creativity, and determination. As they prepare to receive diplomas and degrees, let us walk with these young people in prayerful gratitude for the many blessings that have made this moment real and filled with great potential, even as they can't gather together for ceremonies so we celebrate them that much more today. In gratitude, we pray for families and the many who have sacrificed and worked to see them to this hopeful moment. In gratitude, we pray for the teachers, professors, and administrators who have challenged, cared, and crafted them along this academic journey. In gratitude, we pray for their fellow students who have taught them more about friendship, collaboration, and sharing. God, even as they have faced challenges and accomplished much, we understand that their lives move into a new chapter where there will be more challenges to face and more will be demanded of them in order to accomplish good things. May your grace cover their anxieties and fears so that they may stay encouraged about the future as citizens of the world in service to the world around them. Give them patience and hope to energize their search for work that is just and makes proper use of their gifts, or at least lets them live safely. Give them courage to face the challenges of carving out a place in society where they might live in peace, service, justice, and gratitude for each day. O oh God, as your church, we ask your blessing upon Sarah, Everett, William, Emily, Adam, and Alex. Remind them of where they come from, of who they come from, that there is a community supporting them no matter where their dreams take them, and a place to return when they are able, even if it's in disappointment. 
As they make their own mistakes, remind them that they are loved. As they stumble with doubt or indecision, bless them. And no matter what, may they always know that they are a child of yours and nothing else in this world gets to define them. May your spirit guide them as they unfold the next chapters of their lives, help them to enliven hope in the world and bring good things to your kingdom. And may this time of celebration be a reflection of the blessings that they find in knowing and loving you, for they are not alone. For this is the day that you have made, and we are glad and rejoice in it. And we continue to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to thank you for joining us for our online worship service and for adapting and doing the best we can while we can until we can meet again together. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you this day and forevermore. Now I'd like to invite you to sing along with me to come a fount of every blessing, and the words will be on the screen. Please join in with me. I don't like singing alone. Come, O fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing your grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of endless praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, Mount of God's unfailing love. Here I pause in my sojourning, giving thanks for having come. Come to trust at every turning, God will guide me safely home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the came to rescue me from danger, precious presence, precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I am drawn anew. Let that grace now, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to you. Prone to wander, I can feel it. Wander from the love I've known. Here's my heart, oh, take and see.